Hey everybody, welcome to Stoveside Chats. My name is Chad Blackwelder. Um, happy Wednesday, happy June. Um, we've got a good interview today. I hope it's going to happen. I was having a little bit of difficulty um, bringing them in, but let's see. We're live again, so um, thank you everybody for waving in. Sorry about that. All right, Ron, I got you. There you go. How are yep. you, sir? The first, uh, <laughs> the first two requests I sent just didn't didn't go through. Apparently, yeah, it was weird. That's it. weird. Things happen on Instagram. Sometimes it won't let me bring people in, but here we are. Uh, everybody who's joining us, this is Ron Joyce of Joyce Farms in Winston Salem. Um, Ron, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate you being here. Well, very happy to do it and appreciate the invitation. Yes, sir. Um, so, Ron, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll get right into it. Um, I kind of want to touch on a few different things today. Um, obviously, a little brief history about Joyce Farms. And then I want to talk about how and why you guys do the things you do in regenerative farming and end with what the public needs to know and how important it is to educate the public about meat production. So let's start with a little bit of history about Joyce Farms. Okay, well, the company was started by my dad in 1962 as a poultry distribution company. And we were primarily distribution uh, for maybe up until the mid to late 60s. And then we started doing further processing. Uh, I'm going to reposition this for just a minute. I'll keep talking. Sure. Uh, yeah, no problem. We, uh, we started doing uh, cut up and and basically doing further processing back at a time when the poultry industry was not very accommodating to customers. Uh, there was a time when, when the poultry companies wanted to uh, produce a whole bird and that was it. So, so we're sort of the further processor that gave people what they wanted. <clears throat> and, um, and then about that, uh, I guess it was in the early 70s, the fast food chicken movement and at that time, we were only doing chicken distribution. Uh, so it started exploding. Um, and the, the uh, owners and operators of the Kentucky Fried Chickens and all those that followed wanted specific sizes. And they wanted simple things like, we don't need the giblet with it. You know, we don't, we don't need the necks. We don't sell all the livers and gizzards. So they wanted what is very common today is a wog, but a lot of the producers would say, nope. In fact, I had a general manager tell me, will you tell those customers that every chicken we grow has a neck, a heart, a liver, and a gizzard, and if they buy a chicken, they're going to get it with it. <laughs> so so <laughs> my dad and I talked, and we said, you know, this is an opportunity. Let's give the customer what they want. So our first further processing was just basically pulling the jibs out, sizing the birds to the spec that they wanted because portion control in food service is very uh, important and repacking what the customer wanted. So we kind of did that, uh, you know, all along for years. And uh, then we started uh, doing the fast food cut up and really getting into more further processing. And I just got to the point that that business was no longer enjoyable. It became strictly price and companies were cutting corners. It made me a little uncomfortable. Uh, and I was in a position that we've either got to do that or go out of business. And we started looking at alternatives. And a market that we found that we thought was very underserved was uh, chefs. And um, uh, chefs didn't buy, you know, 2,000 pounds of chicken in a delivery. <laughs> but but they, they had specific needs. And so that's when we started branching out with more product, adding turkeys, and then eventually did a little bit of beef and a little bit of pork, mostly in the distribution business. And that led me to getting to know some of the chefs that we were dealing with. And they had special requests, like they, uh, a lot of them wanted uh, a French breast, which is something the plants, and that's, I don't think to today, that's a, a, an item that anybody's been able to automate. <clears throat> that's all done by hand. And they wanted portion-sized breasts. 
Now that's a very common thing now, although some of them aren't sized very well, but, but um, um, chefs wanted <clears throat> products that were not normally available from the larger processors. So again, right. going in that direction, we started catering to chefs. And in that process, and you're saying why we do what we do, well, we do it because we're crazy. Uh, 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 I got to know a lot of the chefs and some of the better chefs in the country that were buying our product and um, because they thought it was better. And I said to them, and, and we had two labels in, Ashley Farms and Tanglewood Farms, dedicated to the chef market. And I said, this is the best chicken you're going to find in America. And, and I truly believe that because of what we did in sourcing and only buying the, the best of the best and our hand cutting, hand sizing, everything that we did in our plant made the product superior. So as I got to know some of these chefs, they started talking to me and they were either some had trained in Europe or been to Europe, started asking me about La Belle Rouge poultry. I had no idea what it was. I started investigating it, made a trip to France and was absolutely blown away by the quality the flavor and the eating characteristics of these old heritage chickens that the Lavelle Rouge program had, had uh, kept from going extinct. Uh, they, they had basically uh, kept those breeds and, and, and kept the bloodline alive. A lot of the old heritage meat and poultry from years ago is, is completely gone now. It's just disappeared and it's gone forever, unfortunately. So I got very interested in this, and, uh, but the obstacle was cost. Uh, for example, um, the Poulet Rouge, which is the special breed, it's the best of the best of the LaBelle Rouge, is a naked neck chicken, which makes it look a little strange. It's kind of a red brownish colored feathers, but um, the, the, it has very thin skin and the skin gets extremely crispy and, and they consider it just the best of the best in France. And in France and most of Europe, the La Belle Rouge breeds, breeds, and there's several, are considered the best in the world. And we chose the one that we thought was the best of the best. The obstacle to us was getting the product here. And I tried a different, a lot of different scenarios, flying product over and getting it through customs and, and, and uh, US, the USDA and all that. And it, j it just wasn't going to work. So I came to the uh, shocking realization that we were going to have to grow those birds. We we're going to have to hatch them breed them, hatch them, grow them, and do everything they're doing in France. So we took that chance because I thought the product was worth it. But the big obstacle to us was these are old, slow-growing birds. They take 12 to 14 weeks to reach about a three-pound dress weight. And we were, and then still are today, competing with a commercial breed that grows in six weeks to about four to four and a half pounds. And when you look at air chilling a bird, which is a lot more expensive than the water chilling and you don't get the weight gain and all that. So it put us in a, in a position where the bird is unfortunately a good bit more expensive than commercial, but we had to evaluate, was it worth it? And we thought it was worth it. So we continued that. Looking at the difference in those genetics and how much difference impact it had on the older genetics and slower growing animals, the animal that has time to develop flavor. And there are a lot of physiological differences. For example, in a commercial chicken today, uh, the fat is mostly deposited on top of the meat under the skin. You won't find that in our poulet rouge. It's actually marbled in the meat, which is why the flavor is there. But the extra growing time, oh, and the feed conversion. Now, and I'm not criticizing the American chicken people because they've done an amazing job of producing a really good protein at an unbelievably cheap price. I mean, it's, it's you know, it, it's absolutely amazing. But there are some alterations in that. There's some changes. Uh, one of the things is the, uh, besides the flavor, uh, the amount of moisture picked up in the meat, meat itself. And it's just a completely different animal. If you look at our Poulet Rouge compared to, uh, compared to, uh, sorry, I got a guy coming in. That's all compared right. That's to okay. a guy. Uh, to a uh, to a chicken that's uh, you know commercially produced, uh, night and day difference. Even the physiology of the bird. Uh, the Poulet Rouge has elongated breasts, has a very high kill bone, has longer wings, longer legs. So completely different animal. Absolutely. 
And and when I was telling chefs that the the uh, the Ashley Farms and, and Tanglewood Farms, which is now our Naked line, was the best in America, our Naked line still is. No antibiotics, uh, all grain diet, no animal byproducts in the feed, and uh, uh, just just a superior product for what's available here in America. But I wanted to create the best in the world. And so that's when we decided to take the uh, chance and bring the, uh, the LaBelle Rouge breed to uh, America. From that, what I learned was genetics is the number one thing to start. So we started looking at cattle because a lot of these same chefs that kind of pushed me to do the LaBelle Rouge uh, started asking about grass-fed beef. And you probably know grass-fed beef has become enormously popular. The demand has risen faster than we can produce in the United States. A lot of it is um, imported. And the other thing is some of the grass-fed beef that's produced today doesn't have the culinary characteristics that a chef would want for his restaurant. He, he has to have a consistently high quality, highly marbled, highly flavored, uh, tender, and consistently tender. And we were told that was impossible. In fact, I had a lot of the chefs that were buying our LaBelle Rouge chicken said to me, I will never put grass-fed beef on my menu. We've tried it in the past because of customer demand, but then the customer doesn't like it. So I disappoint my customer and I'm just not going to do it. So we had to fight that battle for a while, but we, with Dr. Alan Williams, he had uh, basically um, saved uh, uh, the Aberdeen Angus breed from being extinct in the United States. I think it's pretty much gone in Scotland. It, it, we can trace this breed back to the 1840s with Hugh Watson in Scotland, uh, in Aberdeen, Scotland. So again, another old world breed grows a lot slower and smaller. Mm -hmm. Similar characteristic to the chicken. Uh, our uh, live weight will be around 1,000 pounds, 1,100 pounds. Hot carcass weight will be around 700. And it takes about 30 months to get that animal to that point. Wow. 100% on grass and forages. And that's important, not just grass. In addition to the unique genetics that we have, our pasture program is very strict. And there's usually 18 to 20 different varieties of plants. And they have to be legumes, uh, grasses, brassicas, and forbs. And a few years ago, we started working toward regenerative agriculture because, you know, it, it kind of makes sense, but the more nutrient dense and the more healthy the forage is for the animal, the better meat you're going to get. Well, in order right. to get that, you have to have, uh, you have to have healthy soil. And our soil in America today is probably less than one half percent carbon. And it's been just really depleted. Uh -huh. So we have found through our regenerative program, which we call Honest with Nature, because I haven't found a regenerative program that encompasses all the things we do. And our program was written by Dr. Alan Williams and uh, a friend of his from Michigan State University. But it encompasses, it's, it's a complete program. And we found that when we convert these pastures, we can increase the carbon in the soil from one half percent to 1% a year. And the experts told us that it would take 50 years to get back up to a 5% of soil carbon. We've been able to do it in five years. And not only does it produce a better forage, it produces a better animal, it produces better beef, but it's extremely important for the environment. Uh, through regenerative farming, we can actually pull CO2 out of the air and through photosynthesis, through plants, put it, put it in the ground in the form of carbon. And there are also some things that we don't have long enough to go into today, but, um, you know, when you start rebuilding the soil and quit using synthetics and, and chemicals, <clears throat> the microorganisms and the fungi come back. And in, in, in a you know, matter of years, one of the things the fungi and the, the microorganisms do is they have the ability to pull nitrogen from the air. Sounds kind of funny out of thin air, but, but if you look, nitrogen makes up 70% of our atmosphere. It's 21% oxygen, the rest, you know, other gases. But if you, that, that equates to about 34,000 tons of, of nitrogen above every acre of land. So why are we putting synthetic nitrogen? And that's another whole podcast about how we came about after World War II needing to use nitrogen that wasn't needed for the bomb. So, 
So from there, we developed our, our poultry, I mean, our, our beef program, and we're getting USDA choice and some prime out of 100% forage pasture-raised product. And we've got some of the best chefs in America that actually, before the pandemic, were featuring uh, our product on their menus. Of course, you're getting a sense now that I like to do what's the best in the world. So we had to, we started searching for pork. And we found the old spot out of Gloucestershire, England, which we can trace back to the 1790s. Excellent product, marbles well. We can get pork marbled almost as well as our choice beef. Wow. So I like to say to people, our naked line is the best in America, and we have a chicken, a duck, a turkey. But the heritage line is the best in the world. And those are all slow-growing breeds. Again, no, nothing ever added, no hormones, no growth stimulants, no antibiotics, no drugs. But what we're going for there is flavor. <clears throat> and the pork is pastured on regenerative farms too. Now, an obstacle to pork was when we identified the uh, Gloucestershire Old Spot as the breed we thought would produce the best pork. The problem was they're not available. There's less than a thousand of these sows left in the UK. Huh. And our breeding program in Eastern North Carolina will probably keep that, maybe the only thing that keeps that breed from becoming extinct. In fact, we, we have more pigs in Eastern North Carolina of this breed than, than are in UK, I believe, right now. But, okay. And so great marbling can produce a great cured ham. Years ago, I was at the Seattle Show in Paris, and I had my first taste of an Iberico ham from Spain. And I thought I was in heaven. I couldn't believe yeah. it. I embarrassed myself. I kept going back for samples so many times. <laughs> and I couldn't believe the texture and the taste. So um, we started doing some research. And uh, Dana Hansen at, at NC State actually spent a month or so over there studying the Iberico and the ham. And he told me the key to their ham was not necessarily the acorns that they finished on. Acorns is a source of fat, but... It was the, they had highly marbled uh, meat that uh, a lot of intramuscular marbling yeah. and that if we had that, we could probably go to the long-term aging. So again, to shorten that up as quickly as I can is we, we did an 18 month cure instead of a 12, which is probably the most people go here with a prosciutto. It turned out so well, we continued. We went to a 24 month and that product is, unbelievably better than the 18 month <clears throat> and it's being done the old world way by a company that started curing hams in 1946 right in North Carolina uh, Waco uh, down in uh, Goldsboro uh, so I wanted to create a ham that would be as good as and maybe we even be a little better who knows than the Iberico ham from Spain because that Spain is highly sought after but extremely expensive yeah, and um, uh, we had an event, as a lot of folks know, down at Tidewater Grain Company. They're growing Carolina Gold Rice, and um, Charles represented Joyce Farms, and you guys were very generous with um, helping us out with that event. We really, really appreciate it. And we got to try some of the ham that you're talking about, and it is fantastic. All the chefs were absolutely floored. Um, such a great product. And, Ron, I want to touch on a few things really quick, and then I want to hand it over to you. We have just a little bit more time, and I know you have a message for the – for the uh, public out there, which I think is really, really important. Um, you guys make sure you go to, um, let's see, the website is joyce-farms.com. There's a right. great video on regenerative farming that really goes into great depth about how important it is um, to raise meat this way. And also, Joyce Farms is in Winston-Salem. I just want to let you guys know um, they are doing a lot of things really, really cool there. I know that you guys have a slower line, so you can keep an eye on quality. You guys hand cut, hand pack, hand label everything. You have a great conveyor system, which allows those high standards with maximum production. And really important, you touched on it earlier, air chilling, super important. As a chef myself, like having that crispy skin on that quality of poultry is absolutely everything. So, and at their facility in Winston-Salem, um, that includes your processing facility. That's where all the administration and management is and sales. There's a test kitchen there. And like you said, there's a hatchery there because you found it more, you know, more and more doable for your model to kind of bring things over here. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of great reasons for you guys to check out Joyce Farms. Make sure you're doing that. They're 
one of my favorite companies. I've got to work with them a lot in the past. So, Ron, I know you want to talk to the folks about what's going on and um, how people's dining habits are changing a little bit, their eating habits, and what's important for them to really, really know about it. Well, what we're trying to do, and as a small company, you know, we don't have a massive marketing budget, so most of our marketing is word of mouth between chefs and our blogs and, and uh, you know, videos that we're doing now. But um, people need to re-understand, chefs and consumers, what regenerative agriculture really means. And, and you know, it's sad, but I have to caution you. Know your farmer, know your company, <clears throat> because just like natural and organic, a lot of people claim regenerative, and they can write a program, this is our regenerative program. But if you look at our regenerative program, I will guarantee you there's no one in America that does all the steps we're doing, and all of them are important. Because if you do all of them, you improve water infiltration. You, you slow down or eliminate runoff from the farms. There's just so many things. There are people doing regenerative that are just only composting. And I like to refer to that as regenerative light. <laughs> and I refer to our uh, Honest with Nature regenerative program as regenerative done right. And again, yeah. not enough time to go into that. But the important thing today is this. It comes up every now and then. Cancel meat. You know, uh, Epicurus said we're not going to run beef recipes. We're not going to do articles on beef. Beef is bad. Meat is bad. Meat is bad for human health. It is bad for the environment. It is bad for the animals. Um, uh, Eleven Madison park in new york took all the meat off their menu and this has happened before we all remember yeah. meatless mondays and all this to me it sounds like a lot of noise that represents five percent or less than the population but but be it as it may uh be is that if chefs believe this and some of it's true some production systems are better than others and some are better and some some are good and some are not so good if you really think about that then look at your sourcing and look at how your meat and poultry is produced. Because if it's the old breeds produced on regenerative farms and ranches, that meat is good for human health, supports human health. It's excellent for the animals. We have the highest animal welfare program in America, AWA and GAP. And our, our beef and our poulet rouge are step four. Highest you can, you can get if you're not slaughtering on the farm. And, um, so, and when you look at the environmental impact, we actually are positive for the environment because we can take CO2 out of the air through the plants and we keep living plants year round. We have cover crops because the longer you have that plant, live, plant living, the more CO2 you're pulling out of the air, the more carbon you're putting in the soil. It's hugely beneficial for, beneficial for the farmers financially because eventually he weans off all these uh, inputs. Uh -huh. But you know, just throwing meat out to me, I, I, it just popped in my brain when I started hearing this coming up again. As I said, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If the bathwater was dirty, just change the bathwater and keep the baby. So That's exactly there, right. There is a way to grow meat and poultry in a way that's positive for the animals, positive for the environment, uh, supportive of our health, and good for the farmer. And that's yeah. another issue we don't have time to get into, but... A lot of farmers are suffering today, and regenerative helps put money back in the farmer's pocket. So That's right. we're really proud to be one of the leaders in that movement. Yeah, you guys do such a great job with that. And just to kind of give folks an idea, like that sort of farming that you're talking about, it creates a, a deeper sponge within the soil. It holds a lot more water. Um, yes. Back when, and I know that like the, the plot grazing kind of mimics how bison used to graze on the Great Plains, when the Great Plains were super, super healthy. Yep. And the animals, those huge animals on, on that land helped to keep it that, that healthy. So you guys, make sure you educate yourself. Like Ron said, um, read your labels, know, know your farmers, get to know the people who make your food is super, super important. Ron, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate your time today. Chad, appreciate it, and appreciate NCDA's support of North Carolina produced products. You bet. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.